Hello and welcome back to Earthbeat Visions, a history of the future sound of London. Today I'm going to be looking at some more music and transmissions from 1993, opening with Cascade. Release date 25th of October 1993. Fandom, as it's called now, tends to exist on a number of levels. In music you'll get casual fans who own a few records or like a lot of songs, normal fans who own most of a group's albums, Big fans who will try and pick up everything they can find by the band and sign up to mailing lists and so on. And mega fans who do stupid things like creating a multi-part YouTube series covering every track in a group's catalogue. To the first two categories of those, Cascade was the first FSOL release since Papua New Guinea nearly 18 months before. Tales of Ephedrina, released under an obscure alias and without a single, sold worse than Accelerator and didn't chart, and so would have slipped under the radar for anyone not keeping a specific eye out for ever so well. And so Cascade was a big return for the group, and a year after signing, the first actual ever so well release for Virgin. Why did it take so long? In Gary's words, we're setting ourselves up with a hard act to follow. The next track should just be as fucking enlightening as Papua New Guinea. And that's quite hard, when you set yourselves up to try and be an innovator, we could both end up in an asylum. There's also the fact they had to entirely rebuild the Earthbeat studio, dealing with all the technical issues that came along with that, including the loss of their bass sound, as well as developing an entirely new sound for their music. The KISS test transmissions featured new material described by Yage and Cyberface as research. Even the Tales press release used the phrase. It's clear that they weren't just going to throw out any old material as a new single. They could churn out several tracks a day if they were particularly focused, and many of them would be releasable, but listening to tracks like Skyscraper and Tokyo Travel, it's clear that it would take them a little longer to forge the sound that would define their next era. The pair confessed as much to Melody Maker in July 92. Gary Cobain said, A lot of people have said the name is cocky, which it is, but in a way calling ourselves that is a constant challenge to ourselves. The name does engender this amazing quality control, unless we come up with the goods every time we're going to get slagged. We know that, and we've laid ourselves open with that name. Actually, confides his colleague Brian Dugans, that's why there may not be another Future Sound of London record for six months, or there might never be another Future Sound of London record. If we can't keep making music that's different or innovative, then we won't release anything. With Cascade, the band believed they finally had a worthy comeback record, a track that took their sound a huge step forward without compromise. And it's fair to say they succeeded, the piece having become a classic of the early 90s ambient techno scene. With its driving breakbeats, it's certainly more rhythmic oriented than most of Lifeforms would be, but the layers of melodies, ethnic instrumentation and atmospheric sounds mark it out as a conscious step on from the techno with a twist approach of Tales of Ephedrina. One of the things I find fascinating about music from the 20th century is a fairly fast rollout. Unlike today, most bands would put out some music at least every 18 months, and gaps between albums were usually punctuated by B-sides, and how that makes it easier to hear an artist's development. Although 1992 provided some out-of-character releases for Dugans and Cobain, such as People Living Today, on the whole it's possible to draw a line between Papua New Guinea, Tales of Ephedrina, Cascade, Lifeforms, the Lifeform Path single, and ISDN, each one feeling like a natural evolution from the previous. In defining their new sound, the band also introduced a new approach to singles, the multi-part suite. In an era when dance mixes were the most common type of B-side, with the odd artists still providing original tracks to back up singles, FSOL decided to explore how far the format could be pushed. They initially had no real plans to release a single at all, however Virgin were consistent, and so they set about expanding Cascade into a vision that matched their own ambitions. Working within the UK chart limit of 39 minutes 59 seconds, in the 90s the band crafted mini-albums that took the source material and pushed it in numerous different directions. Part of this came from their approach to working. We have a pretty much one-off attitude to our work. Once it's recorded, we don't really go back and remix. If we ever remix anything, then we start again, which is how this 38-minute single stuff has come about, Gary told Radioactive in 1994. And part of it was the pair's desire to create immersive music, as described on the single's poster as New Complexity Compositions, 32-minute soundscape. The format is an unusual one, as although the length and indeed depth of them fits the idea of them being more like mini-albums, they also do have a single-like feel in that some tracks are quite clearly alternate takes on the same idea, Cascade maybe more than any other. Parts 1 and 2 feel like a single 16 minute track in their own right, being structurally similar and featuring most of the same elements, right down to the CD-only short form being a radio edit of both parts. 
Part 4 is a radical reworking of the same theme, while parts 3 and 5 are alternate takes of tracks that would be later released. While that makes it seem like the single would be of little interest to anyone other than hardcore fans, however, it ignores a key factor. The version of Cascade on the single is radically different to the version on Lifeforms. The skeletal, drifting ambient of the album version forms the base of the single version, but the breakbeats, flutes, main koto melody, synth arpeggios, field recordings and numerous other elements are all exclusive to this version. Using a radical reworking of the album track as the single's A-side was another key component of the band's unusual approach to the releases in the 1990s. The track had been spotted by both the band and a and man Rob Manley early on as a potential single. Manley could hear the potential in the track right back when it was the skeletal album version, and encouraged the group to work it into a single. Overall, the use of samples, the considerably more ambient approach, and lack of any overt techno sounds separates the music from almost all the group's previous releases, only aligned with a few tracks on Tales of Evadrina. This thematic change was reflected in the single's press release. The future sound of London's music is founded on the idea that life on Earth is strange. The romantic modernist phase of electronic music depicting science fiction futures or space missions is over, almost, despite a late surge. This suggestion was a bit hasty, with 90s ambient artists like Biosphere and Deep Space Network flourishing at the same time, and a surge of interest in retro sci-fi electronica starting in the late noughties. The imagery surrounding the music is similarly much more organic than the group's sci-fi leaning era, developing on the visual idea introduced on Tails. The cover features the very first appearance of the Spike model, known by the band as Spikey and often referred to among the fanbase as the electronic brain. The creature was conceived by Buggy, although the 3D graphic was modelled by Olaf Wendt, a German computer visual designer who's gone on to find international success working on the likes of Game of Thrones and Ad Astra. They had some 3D capabilities at EBV, many of which can be seen on the band's music videos, but Olaf was using Soft Image 3D, which at that point was cutting edge. This is why Spikey looks so iconic, was used so much, and why the graphic still stands up surprisingly well today. On paper, a ball with tentacles is perhaps not the most original sounding concept, but the visual realisation is striking and has become one of the most iconic aspects of the group's imagery, featuring on most of the group's subsequent artwork and in many videos. On the cascade sleeve, Spikey is floating above a void with abstract patterns behind, possibly waves at the top, although it's incredibly hard to tell. Waves would certainly make sense with these singles' aquatic themes. The cover varies very slightly over its various formats, with US and European CDs and 12 inches featuring different font sizing and placing. Interestingly, the only credit given for the cover is part of the overall Art Sound Technology EBV 1993 credit. Indeed, the entire credit section is unusually truncated to four lines. The EBV logo is present in the Art Sound Technology section. A repressing of the 12 inch was reissued in a generic virgin black and white sleeve. The music video similarly expanded on earlier imagery, particularly the CG aspects of Metropolis and Stacker 92, using similar style graphics but in a far less crude way. An animated Spikey is seen hovering over similar backgrounds to the single's cover. Indeed, the promotional poster suggests the cover is actually a screenshot from the video. Various computer-generated shapes float around, interspersed with black and white footage of Brian and Gary walking around a forest in Highgate. There was also a studio shoot and footage of a car park corridor somewhere near Marble Arch. The video was directed by Buggy G. Riphead and shot with a three-man crew, including giant steadicams. There's no narrative, and some shots are reused a couple too many times, but overall it's a fairly evocative video that was no doubt very impressive to audiences of the time. To the band, a bit less so. In a series of interviews with Music Technology magazine in early 94, chronicling the band's audiovisual experiments, Gary said, I think we've got quite a soulless video. I think that's one of the problems of using too much 3D manipulated work. We had a certain budget, and a lot of that budget went on generating imagery that in its present form is not at its most potent. In retrospect, I wish that we'd spend a week filming very good footage, chroma keyed and otherwise, rather than spending so much time in computer time. Undoubtedly impressive for their time, the 3D elements do often feel, well, computer generated. And with the band's increasing interest in organic sound, it's unsurprisingly they were also after organic visuals. As always, the band were too ahead of their time to fully realise their goals. The video is a rare example of the pair featuring prominently in the video. In the future, their faces would take a back seat. 
Nevertheless, it's striking, memorable, and overall an incredible video. The soft model shots of Spikey being particularly impressive. Although tempered slightly by regular appearances of phrases like not quite on a par with Papua New Guinea, a disputable conclusion in itself, this single received almost uniformly positive reviews in the press, and sales were strong, with the track charting a mere five places lower than Papua at 27. Not bad for a distinctly less commercial record, released after a 16-month gap. No Top of the Pops performance or video was forthcoming, although this was undoubtedly low on the band's mind at the time. Cascade was a key record in my own record collecting experience, as the first time I ever back ordered something. Having picked up all the available FSOL stock from my local indie, I was after more, and with the single being advertised in the lifeform sleeve, I asked if it was possible the shop could get a copy in. Put down my deposit, and a couple of weeks later, returned to ask if it had come in. It had, although interestingly it was a US import. It cost £8, at the age of 12, an absolute fortune. I remember it being a gloomy day, returning home with this single I paid a lot of money for, knowing that I was in for something exciting, and I was pretty blown away by hearing how different the track was to the album version. The EP will always feel quite dark to me because of the dark weather of that day and the mystery surrounding this near unrecognisable single version, released on a different record label to the album, what with me having the Astral Works version. In hindsight, it's quite telling that, even at that young age, it was FSOL who made me want to go beyond what was simply available in store and track down everything I could. Later in the year, I'd ask what other releases were available to back order and picked up the Lifeforms and Expander singles in the same manner. I'll forever kick myself for not deciding to check out Tales of Ephedrina at the same time. Cascade Part 1 The first new FSOL track in 16 months makes no attempt to hide its ambient side. Whereas most of their work to this day started fairly quickly, Cascade Part 1 begins with a subtle, down-tempo percussion and samples, followed by a hugely atmospheric synth pad. Even after the Koto melody comes in, the rhythm stays quite subtle, waiting until nearly 90 seconds before the breakbeat comes in. From here on, the drums are layered and fairly complex. It's a remarkably different track to the album version, and unsurprisingly so, as that mix is a very stripped-back ambient affair, and not at all suited to be a single in its own right. The koto and flute samples that lead the single mix are incredibly catchy, the koto chopped up into eight parts, rearranged into the melody you now hear, giving it a certain amount of commercial crossover appeal. The drums and pads from the album version run largely throughout, with the xylophone-like sample only appearing once, in the background at four minutes, after which come field recordings and a synth arpeggio before the track builds up again. This breakdown and build-up structure is one rarely used in FSOL tracks. It's a great example of them pushing their boundaries at this point in the career. Despite the fairly fast pace of the breakbeats, the track never truly crosses over into dance music. Instead, it fits comfortably in the ambient house, ambient techno scene that was popular at the time. Of course, the dense layers and textures of the track made it stand out ahead of a lot of the music around at the time. While a lot of 90s ambient was comfortable working with a couple of synth lines, a couple of novelty samples and an 808, Brian and Gary packed Cascade with all sorts of sounds. The Koto melodies were really beautiful, and combined with the flute and vocal samples, gives the track a feeling of lush, verdant landscape. The synth pad sample and the synth strings have a similar effect, adding in more of an aquatic feel which fits the track's title. As ever, samples are sprinkled liberally over the track, not only the usual unidentified percussive noises and atmospheric effects, but also a number of synth squelches and bubbling sounds which also add to the aquatic feel. I've always associated the mood with stormy oceans rather than the fast-running river that might be linked to the title, but either way there's a definite watery feel. The synth arpeggio breakdown has a touch of Tangerine Dream to it. Unsurprisingly, it would later be reworked as part of one of the Berlin School-style sections on environments. Ultimately, a stunningly beautiful piece of music, and an incredible way to introduce the listeners to the world of lifeforms. Cascade Part 1 was one of two tracks reconstructed for Cascade 2020. Cascade Part 2 The Cascade single is the closest the band got to making a seamless suite that feels close to a single piece of music, largely on account of Part 2 feeling like a natural extension of Part 1. It picks up straight away after the rumbling explosion at the end of the first part with a new rhythmic loop, a squawking synth sample, a conga loop and a four note bass melody. This runs throughout pretty much the entire track and is the part's defining feature. Otherwise, all of the elements of the first part are utilised in much the same fashion, only with more dynamic variation. 
Instead of using the same build-up, breakdown, build-up structure, the piece weaves various sounds in and out, with the breakbeats generally used less and more emphasis on the synth strings. It's a more skeletal, ambient version of the track, less hectic, but still unafraid to charge ahead when the full rhythm track is employed. When played alongside the first part, the two tracks form a single 16-minute piece that works brilliantly as a piece of music in its own right. Indeed, the track's radio edit is actually an edit of this two-part section, complete with the explosion sample in the middle, suggesting the band also considered the two joined parts to be the full exploration of the theme. Like the first part, it ends on a shuddering explosion which leads into part three. The track was first broadcast on the first KISS FM transmission of 93, several months ahead of its release, in a rare outing for single material on radio. Only part three, also heard on live forms, made it to the radio shows otherwise. Cascade Part 3 When I first started writing for this series, I did something I'd been meaning to do for ages, comparing the waveforms of Cascade Part 3 and Elaborate Burn from Lifeforms. Clearly variations on the same track, I'd never previously been aware of their differences. Due to its longer runtime, it's possible that Part 3 of Cascade is just the full-length version, but it was also equally possible that there were two totally different takes of the same track, in the way that Calcium was. And the evidence is in. Filtering out Elaborate Burn's opening environment, the tracks are structurally identical, making Cascade Part 3 the full-length version of the piece. It'll always be best known as Elaborate Burn, as Lifeforms sold far more copies than Cascade, but that version's actually an edit. The band loved Elaborate Burn, and it was a partial breakthrough track that pointed a direction they both resonated with, one of their earliest pure ambient pieces. It's by far the strangest piece the band had released at that point. Other than some oddly staggered sub-bass kicks, it's a rhythm-free piece of surreal ambient, almost certainly based entirely around samples. A uh, descending glassy synth line is the main hook of the piece, repeating throughout, with numerous other sounds and loops weaved in throughout. A flute-like synth sequence provides a hypnotic backing, while cascading piano notes add space and atmosphere. An ethnic-sounding flute and various growly synth lines come and go, and the whole thing is stitched together by sounds from the group's bottomless pit of unidentified noises and textures. It's hypnotic, possibly unsettling, and outright strange. The piano sample is gloriously beautiful, but the rest of it has more of a dark, almost foreboding feel, which gives it a strangely ambiguous atmosphere. That said, it's an incredibly evocative and surreal piece of music, but maybe not for the faint-hearted. Cascade Part 4 After the atmospheric break of Part 3, the Cascade single returns to the main theme of the first two parts on Part 4. The synth pad sample and female vocal sample that tie together both the single and album versions of Cascade are used throughout, returning the single to the aquatic atmosphere of its opening sections. The rest of the arrangement, however, retains much of the darkness of Part 3, with a similar cavernous kick drum rooting the track to a staggered beat. Indeed, cavernous and staggered sum up the track perfectly. Removed from the effortless flow of the original, Part 4 lopes forward uncomfortably on an awkward drum loop. Snare drums and chopped guitar notes echo under huge reverbs. It's a surprisingly repetitive track for the group, although a brief breakdown in the second half provides some variation, but it's a hugely successful one nonetheless and absolutely dripping with atmosphere. Cascade Part 4 was one of two tracks reconstructed for Cascade 2020. Cascade Part 5 Opening on the Cascade single's first actual environment, field recordings made by Brian while exploring a dodgy, run-down fairground in Spain, and followed by similar samples to the opening of Omnipresence from Lifeforms, Cascade Part 5 is structurally and stylistically very similar to Part 1, opening with subtle down-tempo sounds before building up to an ambient breakbeat piece replete with strings and eastern-sounding melodies. The tracks are melodically unrelated, however, with no shared samples, but the style of the piece brings the single full circle. It's also an intriguing look at the group's working process. In the same way that Part 3 is the root of Lifeform's track Elaborate Burn, Part 5 later found life in a radically reworked form as ISDN's original closing track An End of Sorts the following year. And similar to Part 1, the string line here was used as the basis of the Berlin School section of Environments Part 2. Away from the trivia, it's just a tremendous piece in its own right, a dramatic epic that shows off the full extent of the group's masterful command of both sound and melody. Cascade Part 5 concludes the band's first multi-part single in fine form. A dark, unsettling environment closes the track with reversed sounds and a long, forlorn note echoing away to silence. Cascade Short Form Never wants to do things the obvious way, Brian and Gary approached the radio edit of their first Virgin single, Cascade, from an unusual angle. 
Instead of simply cutting the main version, part 1, down to 3.5 minutes, they made an entirely new 4 minute version out of both part 1 and part 2, including the explosive Sieg in the middle. This means the final minute or so of the edit includes the conga, sample and bass loop found in part 2. Gives the track an oddly understated climax, but manages to work pretty well, adding in a level of detail, variation and complexity rarely heard in chart-friendly singles. It closes on a brief exclusive environment, combining the explosion of parts 1 and 2, and the pigeon flap sample later used on bird wings and light forming. I also have a lot of time for the name, using short form instead of radio edit or 7 inch edit. There was a fair amount of this in the 90s, and it just adds a little personality and originality to something which could just be a lot more formal. Underworld's use of short, and Orbital's industry standard also spring to mind. As with all of the group's singles, the track would go on to feature on their 2006 Best Of compilation, Teachings From The Electronic Brain. Overall, Cascade was a huge resounding success, with Rob Manley working brilliantly as the go-between to help Virgin understand and market this entirely new approach to the band's music. The group and the label worked together like a well-oiled machine. Despite the long gap since Papua New Guinea, this was seen as an entirely new era and Virgin promoted them from the ground up almost as if they are a new act. With an excellent charting position for a relatively uncommercial track, it seemed the Lifeforms era was off to a great start. KISS 100 FM Transmission 3, 4th of November 1993 With their first FSOL release in over 16 months out of the way, Brian and Gary returned to KISS FM for a residency broadcast throughout November 1993. The first of these shows opens with a hugely evocative environment, throwing in samples from Tales of Ephedrina, Lifeforms and ISDN, as well as synth pads, water sounds and other effects. It's immediately a step further into the band's growing ambient sound world. Familiar spoken samples, this transmission coming up may rekindle your will to live, you're listening to a test transmission and so on, follow and finally into music. And it's immediately ambient, starting with a sinister Atom Heart track and then some Peter Gabriel soundtrack work. Silent running samples reappear, somewhat predictably, and are played throughout the transmission. There's plenty of ambient sounds used in this first section, although none have been identified. Given the layered nature, it's quite possible this is unreleased FSOL environments. The jazz track that briefly phases and out is much less likely to be unreleased FSOL, of course. Finally, nearly nine minutes into the mix, a beat appears as part of a depth charge track. Still a down tempo piece, but it feels like the moment the show starts in earnest. It's followed by unidentified Kung Fu B-movie dialogue, which throws a little unexpected levity into the show. It follows a run of contemporary down-tempo and IDM music, Space Cadets, Transglobal Underground, Soundclass Republic, Reload, Rabbit in the Moon, Ross 154. The Space Cadets and Transglobal Underground track has the You Will Awake Now spoken sample, most famously used slow down in Ill Flower, repeated on top near its end. This part of the show feels very much like the band sorting through recent favourites by their peers, the Soundclash Republic and Reload tracks even feature beat matching, something the band rarely attempted. The first full FSOL track appears at 26 minutes, and it's Mountain Goat from Tails. With the album now four months old, it's the only track to appear from it on the mix, and the only track to appear from it going forward, and it's a very rare example of the album being featured at all in any transmission from this point. The second full FSOL track follows immediately afterwards, and unusually it's the album version of Cascade, complete with intro environment. Broadcast only nine days after the single was released, this mix would have come as quite a surprise to any fans listening. Intriguingly, it ends with a brief snippet of the synth arpeggio as heard most prominently in part one, suggesting a potential alternate past where the track had a different outro, or was even part of the multi-part single. After a run of 93 material, the band start digging through their record crates and throw together a half hour of much older tracks. Older pieces had appeared on early Kiss mixes and would become a big part of the band's mixes as time went on. These include Colonnade, The Summoning from New Age artist Phil Thornton, Berlinskull synth pioneer Klaus Schultz, Cabaret Voltaire member Stephen Malander, Dub from 23 Skidoo and Joe Gibbs, and Delia Derbyshire and Barry Vermonge's Dreams Colours, an eerie piece for spoken word and electronics that would feature on a large number of transmissions by the band, accompanied usually by FSOL's own sounds, and known informally by fans as an FSOL track called Black and Blue and Green. It's a particularly sinister piece that hints at the darker, weirder path the group were beginning to take. Preceding it is the third proper FSOL track of the mix, Vit, the seventh Lifeforms track to be broadcast by this point. The pattern is repeated for the final section of the first part of the show. Three 90s tracks in the form of The Orb, a Killing Joke remix in Cabaret Voltaire, followed by some older material, Robin Gristle and more Peter Gabriel, and some FSOL exclusives, Bird Wings and Dead Skin Cells, played together as they are on Lifeforms. 
The wonderful thing is how well it blends all together. As someone who's made numerous mixes in the past, I'd know how hard it is to get potentially clashing material to blend, and Brian and Gary manage it magnificently here, mixing 70s industrial, 80s film music, 90s ambient dub and their own unreleased tracks without it ever jarring. One thing that helps connect them is the use of environments, and there are numerous present throughout the show, almost all unreleased. It's surprising that in 2024, with a large amount of the group's archived 90s material now published, that so many environments remain unheard outside of one or two transmissions in the early 90s. The second part opens with various sound effects that would later appear on Lifeforms and ISDN, along with an unknown piano piece before leading into a Hawkwind track. Hawkwind are a group who one might more closely associate with the later amorphous psychedelic material. Amorphous supported Hawkwind in London, but they utilised electronics enough for them to fit in with FSOL 2, and The Forge of Vulcan is a Berlin school piece not dissimilar to late 70s Tangerine Dream and Ashra. Fittingly, it's followed by the first broadcast section of Environments, a short ambient interlude with bells and field recordings. After another 80s moment from Brian Eno and David Byrne's iconic My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, most of the next hour is early 90s based down tempo music. Among these are two more FSOL exclusives, Cerebral and Domain, by far the most ambient pieces in this part of the show. Cascade Part 4 also finds its way over for a one-off broadcast. Also in this section are two Pete and Namloot tracks. Despite their many similarities, the mix of acoustic instruments, samples and synths, an incredibly prolific output, the use of the EMS synthy, FSOL were one of the few big names on the 90s ambient scene to never actually work with Namloot. For the last half hour, the show returns largely to old material for a final time, including the industrial hip-hop of Fats Comet, a Miles Davis clip that would become a transmission staple, more Cabaret Voltaire and Delia Derbyshire, New Age synth from Kitaro, a Hubert Parry composition, and a piece from John Hassel and Brian Eno's legendary Fourth World album, Possible Musics. Fats Comet Trap might be more recognisable to FSOL fans as the source of spoken samples at the start of We Have Explosive Part 3, released four years later. The transmission ends with the final new FSOL track, the first airing of Eggshell, making the number of Lifeforms track broadcast at this point, over six months before the album's release, 12, which is much more than half the album itself. It's difficult to separate the 93 transmissions out in the mind, with each being overwhelmingly long and stylistically somewhat similar. That said, the third show definitely continues the subtle trend of moving further from dance music towards the collagist approach they would become best known for, featuring huge amounts of then forgotten music from the past, more original material and plenty of exclusive environments linking the tracks together. Indeed, there are only a couple of tracks with four to the floor beats in the entire show. In contrast, the movie dialogue samples are still silent running 2001 A Space Odyssey and Last of the Mohicans. The sample library will get a greater expansion for the band's ISDN transmissions the following year. When you've oversaturated yourself with FSOL material and trivia over the years and reached a certain level of nerdery that can only be excited by tiny details, like myself, there's still a level of interest here that comes from many, many lifeforms and ISDN samples sprinkled over the set at normal speed. Lots of sounds on the albums have slowed down, so hearing vocal snippets and strange whooshes at their proper speed retains a certain sense of novelty for those desperate enough. As with the others, it was originally released in the pod room in 2008. Unusually this time as two 90 minute tracks as opposed to the 30 minute format of most of the KISS mixes. And once again it's not been available for a long time, although copies exist on YouTube and Mixcloud. KISS 100 FM Transmission 4 aka Transmission 2, the 11th of November 1993. For a more detailed explanation of why I've swapped around KISS Transmissions 2 and 4, see the last video, but the way they were released on the pod room appeared to have been the wrong way around. The second of four weekly shows broadcast in November 93, the fourth KISS FM transmission actually starts in identical fashion to the third with the same environment. Things very swiftly head off in a different direction however with a still unreleased track known as FSOL slash Dead Can Dance Sound Samples, an ambient track that unsurprisingly heavily samples Dead Can Dance. It includes the oft-used Stephen Jesse Bernstein Will You Marry Me spoken sample, and it's then followed by another environment, including two which will be released on the From the Archive series, Environment Birds and Environment Gong, and one which appear much later on ISDM. Initially we were using a lot of other people's records within the show, but eventually we started phasing that part out. Gary, speaking to Melody Maker in 94, is clearly describing this exact transmission. Most of the first 40 minute section, this show is uniquely split into 5 sections of 30 to 40 minutes, consists of then unreleased FSOL material, and it feels like a test run for the group's ISDN transmissions of the following year. Many of the environments have their own titles at this time, 
Environment Birds was actually part of a longer section entitled 18 Degrees to the Left, named after the now Turner controlled 18 Degrees to the Left spoken sample from the 1955 film This Island Earth. There are also samples from Blade Runner. After 8 minutes we finally get to the first full track and it's not even one from life forms. Dirty Shadows would eventually surface 13 months later on ISDM. The version here is the one regularly appearing on transmissions featuring an extended outro including slap bass samples. Afterwards it's into an acoustic guitar sampling environment which would later end up on the album environments. It isn't until 15 minutes that we finally get Lifeforms material, the same pairing of bird wings and dead skin cells that the band included on the previous transmission. Steve and Jesse Bernstein reappears, some of his spoken bits from Face have become iconic FSOL moments, especially More Noise Please, another sample which would go on to name an environment, and not for the last time. An unidentified sample of a man ranting swinging mesmerised by the hopelessness of logic is another that will go on to be regularly used in transmissions, even turning up in the run-out etching of the Lifeforms 12-inch EP. There's also the usual silent running fair and some apocalypse now. Evidently some films contain particular dialogue that really resonated with the group. The only material by other artists in this first part is that which was blended into environments and was almost certainly used in a sampling sense rather than as part of an intended DJ mix. The Diff Jazz piano section in particular is used many times in 94. You also get another totally unreleased piece near the end of the part, Open Enclosure. Maybe it'll appear on a future archive release. The part ends with environments from the Lifeform single, which due to it originally being slated for release before the album is perhaps unsurprising. Lifeforms itself was still slated for a January 94 release date as late as October 93. Still, if we can learn anything from this part, is that a significant round of ISDN material was being worked on alongside later Lifeforms tracks. From part 2 onwards, the transmission reverts to the more familiar blend of other artists' work and unreleased FSOL tracks, although still with a higher percentage of the band's own material than previous entries. It's largely early 92 down tempo material, cusp, hyptopedia, although a 1967 Morton Sobotnik piece also sneaks in. Interestingly, the Earthbeat central computer voice states at one point, ISDN 123 we have full bandwidth, suggesting that the group were well on their way to investigating it as a means of broadcast at this point. The second half of part 2 returns to FSOL territory, starting with a lot of silent running speech and Birdwing's pigeon samples as part of a yet another unreleased environment, before Flat gets its second official outing. Who the Hell Asked You, another working title for an environment that later appeared as part of the environment's album follows, and then it's on to more ISDN with one of the many sections of Tired, which gradually morphs into the outro of Little Brother, a nice link tying the two albums together. Another regularly used environment section follows, which samples Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto, the Jimi Hendrix experience's voodoo child slight return, and Dionne Warwick's Do You Know The Way To San Jose, as well as some saxophone improvisation. The more noise please environment concludes this section. This 4 minute section would be utilised regularly throughout the 1994 3D Headspace tour. Gary explained this approach to Melody Maker in 94. Now what we're doing is exclusive products that mix very small elements from music like Rachmaninoff or Miles Davis, basically all the stuff we couldn't get clearance for with the album. It just allows us to go completely mental, it allows us to do that album with 4000 samples on it and say clear these you fuckers. In that regard, these environmental sections are almost FSOL at their purest, with copyright restrictions more lax on broadcast and performance, here is perhaps the album they would have liked to have released. And then listeners were given a chance to hear the first full piece from the Lifeform single Path 1. Wright's issues would go on to delay the release of this track by another 8 months, making this very much a teaser. A sample saying man was created as the ultimate organic weapon comes along, the movie Giver there, and the band spreading their sampling wings a little further. Part 3 begins with some further environments material and some raw lifeform samples before heading into a proper DJ mix territory for the most part. It's largely 92-93 down tempo and ambient fare, although Edgar Ferreys and Richard Pinhas are thrown in to represent progressive synth music, an Eno Burn track from 81 also appears, and there's also a currently unidentified instrumental post-punk piece in there. There's a brief section in the middle where numerous tracks and samples are layered on top of a Zavuya track, leading to a chaotic mesh of dance music, various traditional and folk pieces, odd spoken samples and the usual strange noises. Part 3, in an unusually backwards looking moment, closes with Papua New Guinea Dumb Child of Q. Part 4 continues in a very similar vein, other than a few environments, most notably the opening of Among Myself, it's almost all 92 and 93 electronica. As with Part 3, there's very little in the way of movie dialogue. 
One link to the later ISDN transmissions is the appearance of the unidentified performance of John Glover Kind's musical song I Do Like To Be Beside The Seaside, a somewhat whimsical piece that became a regular at this point. A brief appearance of the white noises The Visitation is the only older piece in this section. Part 5 is a bit cheeky, being identical to the second half hour of Transmission 3 Part 1. Still, for a group tasked with putting together 12 hours of radio in a month, half hour repetition can be forgiven. Once again, this was originally released in the pod room and now unavailable. There are a couple of errors on the pod room version, most clear on Teeth of the Wind, which features skipping and digital glitches. Parts of this can still be found on YouTube and Mixcloud. And that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Cascade and the KISS transmissions discussed here. Please do leave a comment below. There are also like, subscribe and share buttons you also might like to press. Next time I'll be closing up 93 with the final two KISS mixes, the band's first essential mix and some remixes for the end of the year. I hope to see you then.